we come together this morning on this land that was lived on for generations by the indigenous people that preceded us, that's still in our midst. We give thanks and respect their presence. We come together this morning in the spirit of life and love and liberty. We come with compassion, motivated by a sense of caring, as well as a need to be with others for support, for nurture, with sense of joy and celebration. We come recognizing how precious life is, how short and unpredictable life is for us, for others, for the 10 people in California who were killed by mass shooting and the 10 more who are in the hospital wounded. Unpredictable. We recognize how fortunate we are to live in communities and a state where liberty and democracy is treasured, are held as precious values. We also recognize how tenuous liberty and democracy as a way of life are when confronted by hate and bigotry. Let us recognize each and every one of us that the future belongs to those who give the next generation reasons to hope. Blessed be. And now we join in the sharing of joys and sorrows. Our responsive reading this morning is um, number 550 in the hymnal. Um, I will get for you all a minute to look for that. While I look to see if it's on the screen, which it's not. Um, it's in the order of service. Excellent. Oh, it's on. OK, great. Thank you, Les. <laughs> um, this is uh, we belong to the earth. This we know, the earth does not belong to us, we belong to the earth. All things are connected. We do not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. That was by Chief Noah Silth. Hope I'm saying his name right. The offertory this morning um, will now be taken. Um, the half plate um, this month is going to Abby's house. Um, we are having um, some music this morning that's going to be very special. It's called Meditation from Pace by Jay Massanet. Massanet. And we are really honored to not only have Olga this morning, but also to have Alea Phillips playing with us. So thank you very much. Your offer, offering will be received. Thank you. 
beautiful music. When I retired and moved back to Maine, we lived as resident stewards at the Good Life Center, Helen and Scott Nearing's homestead, their last homestead. They wrote the book, The Good Life. I used to say that they were the grandparents of the Back to Nature movement, but they're really the great grandparents <laughs> now at this point, Back to the Nature. We lived in a 20 by 20 foot uh, stone room, uh, a portion of what had been a workshop or shed. It did have electricity, but no plumbing. We had a porta potty and a sink that emptied into a bucket. We could use the composting toilet and the running water in the main building about 75 dark feet away at night if we wanted to. We had a wood stove, a bed, table, chairs, and a hot plate, but not much else. We spent a, a day or two each week at our log cabin 45 minutes away, which was much more luxurious than our space at the Good Life Center. It was 28 by 20 feet, had electricity and plumbing. To paraphrase Thoreau, we went to the woods because we wanted to live. We didn't wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. We wished to live deliberately, to front if not only the essential facts of life, at least more of them than we were used to. And we wanted to see if we could learn what living closer to the natural world could teach us. And not, when we came to die, discover that we had not lived. We did live much closer to the earth, its patterns and seasons. Mostly we ate what we grew in our garden, a vegetarian diet rich in delicious greens. Doing that prepared us for our present vegetarian diet. Well, actually, it includes fish and dairy. So that would make us pescatarians, I guess. We continue to live deliberately, trying to learn more of the essential facts of life taught by living closer to the natural world. Actually, we live quite comfortably in the midst of a 50-acre woodlot. The crucial thing to remember is that no one needs to retreat to the woods to commune with Mother Earth. But for me, it's something I enjoy. I do this not because I feel I'm any purer than anyone else by doing so. Rather, it is that I find that I'm lifted up by a sense of communion with the Earth, and many, if not all, of its living beings. I confess this midwinter that my heart hasn't warmed to deer ticks, mosquitoes, or the notorious New England black flies. Nevertheless, I do sense that we humans are only one of Earth's glorious and significant branches of life. Now, for me, moving back to Maine was an intentional spiritual quest in the way of the transcendentalists, a desire to look deeper at the natural world, a source of revelation. Ralph Waldo Emerson advised that go and hear in a woodland valley the harmless roaring of the south wind and see the shining boughs of the trees in the sun, the swift sailing clouds. Now as a child, I felt that beauty and that power of the natural world running through the woods, playing in the streams and ponds of northern Wisconsin. I found my basic spiritual connection because my feet were on the ground and my eyes were drawn to the flora and fauna that surrounded me in the forests, the lakes, the streams. Though I grew up religiously in the Lutheran church, my true spiritual orientation was the pure love of nature, its beauty and energy, along with a morality based on a practical sense of the unity of the natural world. Now as a child, 
Long before ever reading Emerson, I sensed an original relation to the universe. I like to say that I was a trans transcendentalist long before I'd ever heard the word or before I became a Unitarian Universalist. But as I grew up and went off to college, like many other people, I grew ever distant from my original relationship to the universe. I've had to unlearn some things, many things, in order to once again get closer to the natural world. I needed to regain my sense of awe, or in Emerson's words, that there is no wall in the soul where we, the effect, ceases and God, the cause, begins. I appreciate Emerson's use of the word oversoul rather than God. It explains to me that the holy is always accessible to each one of us. Those moments when we feel its presence are memorable. For me, such moments are totally this worldly, not supernatural, not a miracle, but rather human insight, sensing the power of life within us and within the entire natural world. When it breaks through our intellect, it is genius. When it breathes through us, our will, it is virtue. When it flows through our affections, it is love, as Emerson wrote. Now, years ago, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to meet and listen to the late Thomas Berry while studying at Matthew Fox's Culture and Creation Spirituality Institute. Berry was a Roman Catholic priest, a cultural historian, an eco-theologian, and an advocate of eco-spirituality. When Thomas Berry was 11, he told us this story, that he had what he called an epiphany while being in a meadow, a simple meadow. That experience became a primary mythic reference point for him for the rest of his life. Barry said that while we have recognized the inseparable nature of a communion with God and with human community, we have not yet realized that this communion, to be perfected, includes our communion with the earth. He taught that all that exists, the entire universe, complete with the vast solar system and our own little planet Earth, make up for our human community the primary source of revelation. This was a Catholic priest speaking. The evolutionary emergence of our universe is that ultimate mystery from which all things come into being. Shortly after we moved back to Maine, Allison and I made a pilgrimage to the burial site that, of Thomas Berry. It's located on 160 acres on a field in boreal forests in the north, northeast kingdom of Vermont in the town of Greensboro, not far from where Reverend Abigail lives now. Berry requested that he be buried there on the marker of his grave, there's a quote from Thomas Aquinas. The entire universe participates in and manifests the divine more than any single being whatsoever. Now his burial site was appropriately in a meadow. His burial, the deep and abiding archetype which for Barry represented the entire earth community. He carried the significance of the meadow and his epiphany there throughout his life and into his burial. The meadow was where he experienced the earth as the primary revelation. Now, during one of his lectures at the University of Culture and Creation Spirituality, Barry said that each one of us, each one of us has a special myth or myths that are significant for us. Now, using the word myth, Barry didn't imply by it that something was untrue because it was mythical. Rather, he indicated that each of us has a story 
Each of us has an experience ingrained within that helps shape our basic way of thinking and our primary way of understanding our place in the universe. In his myth of the meadow community, Thomas Berry saw the many diverse parts making up the whole. And he understood that the wonderful, abundant diversity made up the larger whole by its presence, by reflecting the mystery of the universe. Listening to him speak, it didn't take me long to identify my myth, my epiphany story. It didn't happen in a meadow, nor did it happen all at once at one time. Rather, my myth evolved slowly over the years. But like Barry, by the age of 11, it was firmly set. My myth centered on the pond, which was a couple hundred yards from the house where I grew up. I played in it, around it, and on it. I learned ice skating on that pond. I caught frogs in that pond, turtles and snakes as well. I spent many hours around it, in it. Years later, I went back home to help clean out my parents of all the possessions for an auction. When the auction concluded and I was alone, instinctively, I walked to the pond. I sat on a bench by the water. And that was the first time then that feeling wrapped in the comfort and security of being at that pond, my pond, I felt my loss. And that's the first time I wept. It's not a surprise to me why it is that I had ponds dug on our property in Blue Hill. I wanted to recreate my childhood myth, my adult myth, my epiphany, if you will. Barry had his meadow, Thoreau had his Walden pond, and I have my pond. Actually, I have two of them. Each of you has your own myth, your own epiphany story. It need not be a meadow or a pond. It could be a tree. It could be a river, a shoreline. It might be a church building or associated with an experience or some place where you sense the miraculous in the ordinary. These myths are where we sense our unity, where all things are interconnected, our at-one-ment or atonement, as some people call it. This is when we sense that we and all things are related, all part of a magnificent unity. In the opening words, Lewis Thomas said, viewed from the distance of the moon, the astonishing thing about the earth is that it's alive. In 1985, Prince Sultan bin Salman al Saud flew aboard the US space shuttle, shuttle mission where he had epiphany. It would be hard not to. He said of that experience, the first day we all pointed to our countries the third or fourth day, we were pointing at our continents. The fifth day, this always gets me, it was only one Earth we pointed to. The year before, in 1984, Joseph Allen was on the second flight of the orbiter Discovery. He said, with all the arguments pro and con for going to the moon, no one suggested that we should do it to look at the Earth. But that may have been the most important at all. Excuse me. Whatever it might be that has helped you to be awake and aware of the reality that everything is interconnected to everything else, Blessed be. Such an awareness enables you to look at all things differently and do things differently. 
When you look at a tree, an animal, or another person, you'll see not objects, things, but extensions of your own being. This is when we sense our relatedness to all that exists and develop a greater appreciation for all of life, all others, regardless of gender or race, ethnicity, ability, or any other minor or major difference. And we begin to sense our relatedness to other sentient beings, and for that matter, all forms of life, and all inanimate objects. That's why we, as Unitarian Universalists, are attracted to Emerson's nature-based spirituality. Transcendentalists remind us that religion is the, religion's task is the human task, to move human beings to act divine spark of compassion. Emerson's understanding of the oversoul, oversoul is that it has no personality, not a person or any kind of special divine being. Rather, it is the presence within each fiber of nature. And as such, it is within our very own human consciousness, as it is within all sentient beings and within every element of the universe. For transcendentalists back in the 1840s and for many religious liberals today, spirituality is far too small of a concept for the unifying of the spirit of life. We don't want a God or a spirituality which someone can pack up and keep in a book or a sermon or a creed or a prayer or a teaching. Spirituality is a way of being and with nature, being in and with life. Spirituality is being in a deep, connected relationship with the earth, the air, the fire, the water, and all that lives, grows, and exists within it. Pause. Breathe it in. Feel it flow over you and through your body, sensing its beauty, sensing its power. It is this spirit that we approach. In this spirit, we approach our endangered earth, sensing that we are all interconnected. It is in this spirit that we are motivated to cherish and protect the earth. Simply put, out of self-interest, we as human beings, regardless of our differences, need to be awake and aware that we are part of this interconnected web of existence that we call Mother Earth. As the tree of life grew, evolved, and spread, we humans became one of its glorious and significant branches. It's time, in fact, it's well past time, that we recognize and celebrate our blessed unity with our sacred mother. We will be protecting our very own species as we do so, and everything with it in which we exist in this sacred and magnificent earth. May it be so. Amen. Let's join together in our next, our closing hymn, number 1069 in our teal hymnal, Ancient Mother.
closing words come from Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives might be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come to the peace of wild things, who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with all their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. I think I still have a tear in my eye from your playing, Alea. That was just amazing. Blessed is the dark in which our dreams stir and are revealed. Blessed is the dark of earth where seeds come to life. Blessed are the depths of the ocean where no light shimmers, the womb of all earthly life. Blessed is the light into which we awake, the light that sparkles on the waters, that calls the tree forth from the seed and calls the shadow forth from the tree. Blessed are we as we move through the darkness and through the light. 